Okay, so here we are, Genesis, uh, the foundation book of the Bible. This is lesson number five. Title of this lesson is The Day-Age Theory. The Day-Age Theory. All right, in our last uh, session we talked about the age of the earth, because whenever you do Genesis, obviously, and you begin Genesis, you're talking about the creation. That issue always comes up, how old is the earth? And we said that we're really only two theories to choose from, if you wish. The first one is the, uh, the old earth theory. We talked about that last week, the old earth theory. And the old earth theory says, well, the earth, the universe, millions and billions of years, millions and billions of years. And the idea in the old earth theory is that matter itself is eternal. It's eternal, it always was. Or it created itself billions and billions of years ago, and through the process of evolution, it has become, or the universe and the earth has become what it is today. I mean, that's you know, the short form. But basically all you know, the scientists that believe in evolution, they write books and, you know, and PhDs and so on and so forth. When you boil it all down, that's basically their theory. Matter always was, or it, or it created itself, and through time and chance, it is what it is today. That's pretty much what it is. And one of the proofs that they offer for this particular model is the fossil record, which has, you know, we showed it, yeah, you know, we showed some pictures last time, you know, the, the geological record, and they say, well, when you look at the fossil record, down at the bottom, you know, you see a simple creatures, you know, and then at the top, you know, the layers throughout history. At the top, you have complex creatures, and that, that is what proves it, you know, complex, most recent, simple, uh, further back, millions and billions of years ago. And of course, we said there were problems with the old Earth model. One of the problems is a theoretical problem or a philosophical problem. And the theoretical or philosophical problem with the old Earth, Earth theory is that, well, it's the eternity of matter problem. You know, in any other branch of science, nobody will, will you know, stake their reputation on the idea that matter is eternal or that something comes from nothing. In no other branch of science will anybody say something comes from nothing except when it comes to proving uh, evolution. That's the basis. So you've got a theoretical problem. No matter how much proof they, 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 they posit after, the basis of their theory is that matter always existed and it evolved to be what it is today. Another problem is the, ge the, ge the geological findings also contradict their theory. It'd be nice and neat if you looked at the geological table, not on a piece of, not on a, a picture, but what actually exists in the earth. It'd be nice if you could kind of you know, buzz saw uh, you know, a thousand feet you know, and I'm down and look at the geological record and see that it, it, it pans out that way, but it doesn't. When you do it, what happens, what you find out is there are complex creatures at the bottom, fossils, and there are comp uh, complex creatures at the top and, and, and at every layer uh, in between. And we talked about that uh, last week. I'm not going to kind of go through that again. Um, so that's the, that's the old earth theory and some of the problems with the old earth theory. And then the other theory, of course, is the new earth theory, or young earth sometimes, 5,000 to 10,000 years old. The idea is that the earth, the universe, is just five, um, the earth is just five days older than man himself. Um, and uh, the new earth model says that an all-powerful being, that we call God, created the universe and the earth at the beginning of time, roughly five to 10,000 years ago. Now there are a couple of proofs, the proofs used for this particular model, the philosophical arguments. Uh, the philosophical argument says, well, how do you know there's a God? Well, think back now. You know, for, every, for every effect, there's a cause, right? So what is the first cause? You know, where does matter come from? It, it doesn't just come out of nothing. It's, it's more logical to think that a supreme being created matter than to think that matter just created itself. Philosophically, it's much more believable you know, to accept the idea that a higher being created the lower being that, than that the lower being simply materialized out of thin air. Also, 
Uh, we have other types of arguments, the moral argument. In other words, you know, people have a sense of right and wrong. Where does that come from? You know, rocks don't have a sense of right and wrong. Where did humans get the sense of what is right, what is wrong? Actually, not so much what is right, what is wrong, but what we ought to do. In every, in every society, no matter what society it is, people have a sense of what they ought to do. Even people who don't believe in religion have a sense of what ought, what they ought to do. You know, you, you ought not to beat up your mother, you know, in, in every society. You know, the beating up your, your own mother is frowned upon in, in, in society. Where, where does that come from? Where does that sense of ought come from if we just come from inanimate objects? And also you know, the whole idea, actually the strongest arguments nowadays is the, strong, uh, is the element of design. You know, if there's design, then there has to be a designer. And the more they uh, explore the you know, microcosmic world, the world we can't see, you know, the more they find out that, 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 the, that the matter is extremely complex, more so than they ever imagined. And so the idea is that if there's complexity and order, there has to be a designer. The more complex, the greater the designer needs to be. Again, those are philosophical arguments that we have uh, to base our beliefs in. Also, uh, the young earth idea matches the archeological and geological findings. The young earth idea says that everything was created at once. And so when you find a mixture of complex and simple organisms and fossil records, well, yeah, that matches with the young earth theory. And then, of course, we have the idea of revelation. Uh, revelation is not a scientific thing, obviously, but the Bible gives us information that we can't know through logic, we can't know through observation. The Bible gives us that, and I'll tell you personally, for me, it's not so much in the book of Genesis, but it's in the book of Hebrews that I go for the faith issue, the revelation issue, where the writer says in Hebrews 11:3, by faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not out of things which are, were made, were not made out of things which are visible. I'll read it again. <laughs> by faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. It, notice it doesn't say that something comes out of nothing. The writer doesn't say something comes out of nothing. He says that something comes out of things not seen. Not exactly the same thing. And so in the New Testament, the Bible, tell, the Bible looks back at Genesis and says, we accept something that we can't mechanically, you know, we haven't seen, and it's one of those things that we accept by faith. Well, I'll give you another thing that I accept by faith. In the Bible it says, when I'm baptized, I receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in me. Well, I don't understand the mechanics, okay, of how a spirit being, God, the spirit being, somehow dwells inside of my, is he just inside my psyche or my brain? Is he all in my, I don't understand the mechanics of how that is done, but I'm not asked to explain how it's done. I'm simply asked to believe that it is done. Just like when you're baptized, right? It says your sins are forgiven. Do you see your sins floating around in the water? You know? No. You believe it because the word tells you this is what happens and you accept it by, by faith. All right, so some of the things that we accept, uh, the young earth model, because this is uh, the one given to us in Genesis and uh, it's the book that we're presently studying. Now there are some, however, who try to combine the biblical account of the evolutionary model and the theories that they come up with and that's the subject of our lesson today. Um, and we're going to talk about the gap, this thing called the gap theory. This is the theory that tries to marry you know, evolution and scripture. This theory asserts that there is a tremendous time gap allowed for between Genesis chapter one, verse one, and Genesis chapter one, verse two. And the gap theory runs like this. 
First of all, the gap theory says that God created the world, all of it. In Genesis chapter one, verse one, in the beginning God created the heaven and earth. Okay, that means that God, everything was done. Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. Then the gap, theory, uh, the gap theory says that Satan rebelled against God and for this reason there was a tremendous cataclysm that destroyed the world and left it void and blank. So this, you know, this idea here would explain the billions of years of fossils piling up in the rock and the aging of the earth to accommodate such ancient fossils. Verse two would be the verse that would describe the earth in the aftermath of the great destruction of the earth. And then the third part of the, uh, the gap theory says that then God recreated the earth in six literal days as it is described in verse three to 31. See what I'm saying here? So God creates everything, you know, fully created. Then there's a, you know, the angels rebel and there's a rebellion and there's a cataclysmic destruction of the earth and the animals in it and so on and so forth. And all the fossils that you see were created at that time because it's just, you know, a day is like a thousand years to God. And so billions of years went by. And then Genesis chapter one, verse uh, two begins to tell the story of how God recreated the earth. Okay. Now this theory is also known as the ruin and reconstruction theory. It's also been called the pre-Adamic cataclysmic theory. And it was first proposed by a man called Thomas Chalmers in the 19th century and it was popularized by the end notes in the Schofield Bible. So you know the Schofield Bible? It's a type of Bible translation. And in, in the liner notes on Genesis, this gap theory is posited as an explanation uh, and an effort to marry evolution and the Bible record together. As I say, the main purpose of the theory was to harmonize the six days of creation with the new science at the time the new science of geology, which was developing the geological timetable in Chalmers' day. So he thought that by introducing the gap, you could have it both ways. Six literal days of creation, you know, six 24-hour days, you could hang on to that idea, and you could account for the hundreds of millions and billions of years that the, that the geologists and the, the young theory of evolution was promoting at the time that he lived. Now, there are a couple of flaws with this theory. Um, the first one is a scientific flaw. Uh, think now, if there was a cataclysmic, that means a worldwide destruction that blew everything up so as to leave the earth dark and void, would it not have also destroyed any evidence of life as well? You'd think. In other words, fossil records are based on the assumption that there has been no change in the earth's past. You know, a fossil record says, well, there was this kind of life, and then there was this kind of life, and it evolved to this kind of life, and then it evolved to, you know, no break in the record. That's what, you know, that's what the fossil record says. Just a steady cycle of life and death enabling us to read the story of the past in the earth's crust. Now, if something cataclysmic happened, wouldn't there be a record of it? And aside from the flood, there's no record of any cataclysm. The only cataclysmic, of, uh, the only cataclysmic event that we see a record of in the earth is, is the flood. And we'll talk about that you know, when we get to that. So, it's interesting to note that no geologist today, for example, believes in the gap theory. So the geologists don't believe in the gap theory, just people who want to reconcile evolution and the Bible, they, they hang on to the gap theory. Another problem with the gap theory is the, the, a biblical argument, a Bible problem. You see, if you accept the gap theory, then you accept the fossil record as well. 
And if you accept the fossil record, then you say that there is a cycle of life and death that is present billions of years before Adam came on the scene. Think about that. That's theologically impossible. In other words, there was death before Adam. Now in Romans chapter five, verse 12, it says, therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so sin spread to all men because all sinned and so on and so forth. So how did sin enter the world? Well, the Bible says it entered through Adam not before Adam. And then if we read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 21, it says, for since by man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. So the Bible says that death came into the world for both man and beast only when Adam brought sin into the world and not before. So if you are positing a theory that sin was there before Adam, think about it now. If death existed before Satan's sin or Adam's sin, then the one responsible for it was God Himself, because He's the only one there. And that's impossible. Sin brings death, not God. We know that. Romans 6.23, the wage of sin is death but the free gift of God is eternal life in our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so as Christians, we need to be very careful to read what the Bible actually says, and we need to formulate our models on what the word actually says without trying to compromise it, you know, or to conform it, you know, to try to squeeze it into a mold, to make it comfortable for us. You know, the world, believe it or not, scientists have been wrong before. You know. <laughs> They've made mistakes. All right, so let's, let's do a study of just that verse and just look at what it says, period. All right? So it says, the earth was. The earth was. Now in the American Standard, in the King James, they, they says, and the earth was. There's a conjunction. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was, a continuation. Now the conjunction and simply denotes a sequence of events that flow one from the other. Now if the Spirit of God through Moses wanted to put a gap there, he could have put a gap there. He could have said in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And then there was this cataclysmic event that took place because the angels rebelled and the earth was destroyed, verse two. Then verse three, and then God re, you know, recreated it. You know, he, could, he could have done that, but he didn't. He said in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth and the earth was, you know, he just kept on going. So, so on the first day in the beginning, God creates the space, the heavens and matter, the earth, now Moses focuses on the matter and describes its condition when it was originally formed. Any other conclusion is read into it in order to harmonize it with a man-made theory. Let's just, uh, let's just go with what it says. In the beginning, there's time, God created an act of will by a supreme being, the heavens, a space, and the earth, matter. So time, space, matter, created by God. When? The beginning. All right. Then it says, the earth was formless and void. Now gap theory people translate this as the earth was ruined, like after a nuclear holocaust or something. But in harmony with the first verse, this verse simply builds on the idea already presented. The basic space and matter was created and verse two comments on the condition of the matter at this time. It has no shape, it has no form, it is empty, it is without inhabitants. So Genesis says, in the beginning, God creates you know, time, space, matter. And then he says, and the matter was formless and void. That's all. It's just a comment on what the matter is. In other words, the raw materials are there. The potential is there, but they are not yet shaped into what we recognize 
as the earth and as the universe. The matter is there. And then it says, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. All right. No form, no motion, no light, no energy, nothing. It's just there. So this phrase is also a descriptive one where the author is not describing what God is doing, but rather giving a description of the universe as the initial elements of time, space, and matter as they have been created. He created time, space, matter, and when you look at the matter, it was just there, formless and void. Darkness over the surface of the deep. The earth was without form, the oceans had no boundaries, there was no light since the matter had not yet been energized. Now Henry Morris, and I mention him a lot, Henry Morris, the, the, he's written several books, The Genesis Record, Genesis Flood, did a lot of work in this area. I quote him, he says, elements of matter and molecules of water were present, but they were not yet energized. Kind of a formless, dark soup, no, no sound, no shape, no form. Okay, then it says, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the water. So fascinating, this verse, so fascinating. Now the name for God here is Elohim. And the term Elohim suggests that God is both unity and plurality and the triune nature of the universe. So think about it, time, space, matter reflects the triune nature of God. Everything is so harmonious when you look at it. Here we see a particular person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, make a particular action. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Someone asked, how many spirits were at creation? And I would say, well, there are three, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, which make up the single Godhead, or God as we call it. And let's not be confused. It isn't one spirit with three personalities. I've heard people try to explain the. It isn't one spirit with three personalities. It is three individual spirits within the Godhead. You know, we, 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 we have the same difficulty in grasping other spiritual ideas as well. I just mentioned before, how does the Holy Spirit dwell within us? I don't know. I haven't been asked to explain it. I've simply been asked to believe it. And the resurrection, all right, as proof of God's divinity, of Jesus' divinity, is enough for me. So the last few verses are comments on the state of what had been created with this phrase, we have a description of what God in the person of the Holy Spirit now does to the materials He's created. So in the beginning, time, space, matter. Then He says, and the matter, it was nothing. It was just soup, formless, void, no energy, no light, nothing. And then God did this. The Spirit hovered, hovered, or moved. Uh, it's not hovered, it's hovered, excuse me, the proper pronunciation, hovered. But in some, some Bibles have moved, hovered. The interesting thing is this word in the original language, rakaf, in Hebrew, means to shake or to flutter. The image is of a mother hen, you know, fluttering over her chicks. The idea is of a rapid back and forth action. The best modern word in English to describe it would be to vibrate. And then the Spirit of God vibrated over the deep, the waters of the deep. So listen, if the earth is to be energized, there needs to be an energizer. If it is to be set into motion, there needs to be a prime mover. Again, Henry Morris. It's interesting to note that the transmission of energy in the universe is in the form of waves, light waves, heat waves, sound waves, 
microwaves, right? And that in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 says that once the raw material was formed, it was energized and brought into its present form by a, di by a divine vibration initiated by the Holy Spirit. How long ago was Genesis written? 1500 years before Christ, 3500 years ago, the writer is saying that matter was energized through some sort of vibrating waves. How long did it take man to figure that scientific principle out? How could they have even known this idea? So energy cannot create itself, formless and void. So the first impartation of energy to the universe is imparted by the vibrating movement of the eternal, all-powerful God. That's what Moses is saying in Genesis chapter one, verses one and two. So in Genesis 1, 1 and 2, we have God creating the elements of the universe, time, space, matter, and then energizing it through vibration in order to bring it into shape and into movement. Now listen, a person is free to not believe this, but they cannot say that if there is a God, this is not a logical and scientifically correct way to bring the universe into being. There must be matter before there is movement. You know, atheists, they, they call it the Big Bang. Well, how did that happen? Well, it just happened. Well, what caused it to happen? Oh, we don't know. It's not important. Now, now the big thing, it's not important. Let's just go with that and then, you know, <laughs> and they'd say, we're crazy. <laughs> All right, so that's the, the gap theory, and I've used that to kind of you know, uh, demonstrate um, exegetically what the Bible is actually saying, how the earth was actually formed from a, a no scientist on my part, but the words are interesting, aren't they? So next time we get together, we're going to talk about this again. We're going to move you know, through, uh, through Genesis, uh, continue moving. And we're going to talk about another important theory, and that's the day-age theory. Are they really five or six? Are they literal days? And why do we believe that? And so on and so forth. I do want to tell you, however, that we're not going to be this slow on every verse. Okay? But Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 11, boy, there's a lot of stuff in there. We need to kind of you know, set the table here and you know, lay the foundation, and then we'll, we'll move on with, uh, with our with our uh, lesson. So that's it for this time, so I hope you'll be with us next time. Uh, and those of you who are watching online or those of you who are watching uh, uh, with the video series, you can always go to BibleTalk.tv and download the uh, class notes for this and eventually be able to download the, uh, the transcript for the lesson as well. All right, we're done, thank you.